Hello. I think we're on. Well, that's good. Um, hello. Ah. Hello, I think we're on. Excellent. Hello, um, thanks for joining us for Bookband 2020, um, a from home literary festival. My name is Dan Richards, and I'm here to host this conversation between wonderful authors, Abby Palmer and Sarah Perry. This event has been curated in partnership with Wasafiri magazine to raise money for the UK based mental health charity Mind. Mind provides advice and support to empower people experiencing mental health problems. Their statistics show that on average, one in four people will experience a mental health problem in a typical year, and 2020 has been far from a typical year. Make your donation to support MIND using the link to the Bookbound Just Giving page displayed below. If you, um, and also, sorry, you can find out more about Bookbound, Wasafiri, MIND, and all of our authors by visiting our website which is bookbound2020.co.uk. And now on for our event. Abby Palmer is a mixed media artist and writer. Her work often includes themes of disability, gender, and multi-sensory interaction. And it can be seen at the Tate and Somerset House. Sanatorium is her first book and was published this month by Penned in the Margins. So congratulations. Sarah Perry is an internationally best-selling author of After Me Comes the Flood, The Essex Serpent, and Melmoth. And she's published in the UK by Serpent's Tale. Um, welcome to you both. Hello, good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, well, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to start quite in a, quite a forward fashion by asking you, Abby, about your paddling pool, which you're not in at the moment, which is sad, but you have the most amazing dress on. So, you know. <laughs> Thank you. But it's uh, apples and oranges, isn't it? Is that the expression? Uh, no. that, yeah. Uh, so my paddling pool is actually my bathtub. It's an inflatable bathtub um, that I use. Uh, I live in a disabled adaptive flat um, and I have a lot of chronic pain. Um, and the thing that really helps with the chronic pain, uh, which is a big part of my disability, is having a bathtub but they won't let me have one because it's a trip hazard for disabled people. Uh, so uh, I have circumnavigated that uh, wonderful predicament by buying an inflatable bath from China. And uh, it's kind of like a, a, hot, a hot tub uh, that you inflate and it's, it stands itself up. And I sit, sit that in the shower and bath in that instead. Okay, we can only hope that the feds aren't watching this so they don't <laughs> come around and take your bath away as, as a trip hazard. Um, and it's it, this particular bath, um, it, it's quite a central character in Sanitarium. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's the I would say, uh, kind of the anti hero or or the uh, yeah, the um, it's definitely a key protagonist. Um, it becomes kind of a metaphor for uh, the my my disability, and that it kind of it's this huge it it's a really unwieldy thing that there's never a good place to put it, and so it always ends up kind of deflating in the center of my bathroom, and then I trip over it in the middle of the night, and it's always there, um, and uh, it's it started out as kind of this glamorous shiny. Uh, thing that's funny to talk about but over time uh, got riddled with fungus and uh, I, I jammed a bit of it in the door and it's falling apart so uh, yeah it feels a lot like my body. I was going to say we've all been there yes absolutely 
Um, and Sarah, I mean, that's that's obviously a terrible introduction then to bring you into the conversation. But at the same time, um, I wanted to talk to you because you've you've experienced chronic pain as well. I mean, there are some wonderful connections between you both as as writers. But it's interesting to me because um, you both have invisible disabilities or certainly had invisible disabilities. Uh, I wonder, Sarah, just if you could talk us through you know, what happened to you just before The Essex Serpent came out? Yeah, I was um, awaiting the publication of The Essex Serpent and began to experience all sorts of very strange symptoms that um, were very easily dismissed as anxiety and stress, even though I don't have anxiety and I very rarely feel stressed. And I turned out to have Graves' disease, which is also suffered by Christina Rossetti and George W. Bush. So um, I feel I'm in 50% very good company. Christina Rossetti obviously couldn't be cured um, of Graves' disease because the medication wasn't around at the time and she was driven insane by the loss of her fertility, um, by the fact that her eyes bulged and her hair fell out and she sort of lost her beauty. Um, so I sort of feel very grateful that I was born in 1979 and can take some lovely drugs. Big fan of Big Pharma myself. Um, and then that led to a catastrophic um, injury really um, in my spine I ruptured a disc about as severely as it can be ruptured and had to have spinal surgery and went through really um, epic baroque degrees of pain um, and so I wrote Melmoth while I was high essentially on pain relief but I'm very very lucky and um, Grace is easily managed and my surgery was very successful so I have a permanent limp from peripheral neuropathy in my left leg and I have a degree of pain but I essentially don't think of myself as being disabled because that would feel like appropriating a more severe degree of physical disability than I have and largely I just feel incredibly lucky and I can run and pick things up and so on so you can jump climb trees I've seen you I, seen you that. I did nearly climb a tree the other day just out of sheer joie de vivre that my limp had got better but um, my husband was fortunately there to prevent the disaster that that would inevitably have been so wonderful um I was just I was just going to say you know um the th the thing though that I read today, because you know um, we're friends, but I haven't up until the point read all your press, which is wonderful. If anyone wants to spend a wonderful afternoon reading someone's amazing interviews, Sarah's really your girl. Um, <laughs> I was unaware, and this goes for both of you actually, that during sort of like times of severe pain, you'd both experienced not just visions, but, but haunting visions. You've both seen what you both describe actually as ghosts um, and that, and you know, sanatorium is through with ghosts, you know, and, and I've actually made a list of sort of all the ghost sightings. One of the wonderful things about having a PDF is you can just type ghosts in and then it comes up loads. But they're really striking the way, Abby, that you, you experience a kind of out of body experience several times in your book. Yeah, um, I mean, I like Sarah, I'm a huge fan of Big Pharma uh, because uh, I now take gabapentin. The reason I was having all these visions was uh, it's actually just uh, extreme sleep deprivation from uh, an, an underlying level of chronic pain. Um, and the thing that uh, gets rid of that is, or, or the, 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 that stop, helped me st uh, stop having chronic pain was uh, gabapentin, which is, um, it was briefly a really fashionable drug uh, for big pharma to peddle to uh, invisible or un uncurable ailments uh, for no apparent reason. It's an epilepsy drug um, and it was really in vogue. And then uh, prisons started cottoning onto it. And now uh, because of uh, the horrible class disparity and uh, prison phobia this country have, it's suddenly really out of favour and they want me to stop taking it. But I've tried to explain that if I stop taking it, my uh, life is constantly put on hold by these visions. They're kind of amazing, really ecstatic and erotic and um, amazing, but you just kind of pass out in the middle of the day and you're suddenly floating in a completely different realm. And that isn't terribly productive. It really affects your sleep. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it it I didn't really take them seriously for a long time um I, I wanted even though they were they're very immersive and very real um I was very ashamed of them and it was only through kind of uh I guess uh creatively romanticizing them I started to realize how important they've been for me as as part of my sense of who I am 
Mm. Um, yeah. I think bearing witness, as you just described, I mean, that runs through both of your books, if we're talking about um, Sarah Melmoth. Um, you know, and actually the Essex Serpent as well, the idea of actually sort of articulating what's going on and to, uh, you know, to, to really look, look and look again, that's throughout your work. And in terms of Melmoth, I know that, you know, you were experiencing pain and then you saw Melmoth, um, I think a couple of times. Yeah, I, it was a very interesting experience and a very disconcerting experience because I've never consciously written about myself. I'm, I'm not really my own subject nakedly in the way that um, many writers are, writers that I admire very much. I mean, I'm in, I am all my characters and I'm in all my books, but not in a, in a non-transformed and direct way. Um, and then I endured this pain and this sense of a disintegrating body and um, a whole identity co-opted by sickness and particularly if you have a visible disability so I had to use a stick for a time um, and had a very very severe burn um, that was very visible and all of those things seemed to re-taxonomize me out of um, kind of health and youth and a degree of comeliness into something that was kind of disgusting and undesirable and actually shameful and really humiliating and I had begun to conceive the idea of Melmoth being a witness to other people's suffering and then I began to suffer and so I began to witness my own and so for the first time my writing became deeply introspective and I was examining my own pain and my own humiliation which is how I conceived of um, my sickness and then because of that I felt like Melmoth was watching me so if you um, put together and I know Abby will understand this if you put together the transformative and almost ecstatic nature of severe pain in the sense that you are driven out of your mind together with um, opiates and gabapentin and amitriptyline and tranquilizers and you're writing about somebody bearing witness, suddenly she was watching me. So I woke up in the middle of the night and Melmoth was on the chair in my bedroom and I couldn't sleep because she was there. And I have a very kind of rational and cold approach to my writing. It's all plot devices. I don't hear my character speak. It's all my imagination. And suddenly all the boundaries blurred and she existed. It was very strange. If only you'd been writing a book about a decathlete. <laughs> need have happened. Um, yeah. I think it would be helpful for those uh, few, very few people watching who, who haven't read Melmoth and maybe don't know who and what Melmoth is. Could you tell us about Melmoth a little? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a novel that was published in 1820 by Charles Robert Maturin called Melmoth the Wanderer. And that is an Irish novel. And it's the story of a man who sold his soul to the devil for an extra 150 years on Earth, swiftly realises this is a terrible idea and tries to persuade people to change places with him. So it's an episodic novel. Um, and he travels to the Spanish Inquisition, shipwrecks, all of this stuff. And when I read it in my 30s, when I was just a young girl. Um, I remember thinking that it would be good to write a novel in which Melmoth was a woman and in which she could visit people across the centuries. And so in my Melmoth, Melmoth is a woman who has been cursed because she denied Christ to bear witness to unspeakable atrocities. And she has been watching all of us all of the time. And if you feel the back of your neck prickle with kind of conscience and anxiety, that's because Melmoth is watching you. So a woman in Prague, finds out about the legend of Melmoth and begins to think that she's being haunted. Mm. And it's huge fun. <laughs> it sounds hilarious. Um, um, and, uh, you know, like the Death Eaters big day out, really, isn't it, Melmoth? Um, that's what I tell everyone. Um, and Prague for you is very much a sort of happy place in that way. I know that you've written there a couple of times and it's very much, you know, it's the place where you can metamorphosize into the Sarah Perry that you want to be. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, I feel very myself there. Um, and I think some of my happiest times have been spent in Prague. And um, the book is very much written from the point of view of an outsider in love with the city, which I suspect is extremely irritating for Czech readers. Um, sure. But I'll be um, into and Abby, I wonder if I could throw that over to you in terms of Budapest, because a lot of um, you know a lot of sanatorium takes place in Budapest. It's a similarly um, sort of grand Budapest hotel, which is what I thought of when I was reading it. It's very much your happy place as well. In the yeah. Book. So uh, for me, I, um, I I guess the other character in the book aside from the inflatable bathtub is the sanatorium um, that is in the center of Budapest um, on 
uh, Margaret Island, which is a, a small island in the middle of the Danube River. Um, and the island, the only thing on the island, or there are a few things, but um, in terms of uh, places you can go and, and and stay. The only there's one hotel on the island um, that is a thermal water rehabilitation center, um, and I managed to wangle some arts council funding to do a, a research project uh, where I uh, rehabilitated my body in this kind of luxury thermal water. Uh, sanatorium um and so the book kind of jumps between the the luxury of that experience and the um the uh kind of lack of luxury in the in the bathtub um uh and it yeah it is a really the the grandeur of it like that that's kind of um the one part of the hotel is uh a, it was built in the early uh, 20th century and it's um, incredibly art deco and glamorous and has this kind of real glamour uh, side of of um, of taking care of yourself like the sense of like old world luxury mm. um, and the type of characters who were staying in the in the hotel uh, were completely like it was like characters from a book there were all these incredibly wealthy women from all over the world who um took the waters uh on a regular basis there were some women who take the waters like three times a year in like all, all over the world like oh i just I, I go to montenegro for a weekend um to 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 take the waters there i go i go and take the waters here and and then like between this quite grueling therapy because uh, taking the waters you're not just sitting in it you do loads of physiotherapy and it's quite painful and you're really challenging your body um but between that they would go to the opera and go shopping and um they were just really grand and um when they were in the water they all had uh turbans on and fantastic makeup like f a full face of makeup and dripping in diamonds and then these swimsuits and then they just sat in the water all day and watched each other um and then had dinner uh, serenaded by a five person orchestra <laughs> it was just really weird you, you get one of the face. tragedies of lockdown i think at the moment that we three people aren't doing that at the moment because you know if we weren't here we probably would be doing that my turban you know it's at the dry cleaners and i cannot get it back <laughs> yeah it's it's hit us all really hard uh, the lack of turbans during lockdown that's yeah. one of my biggest pains that's the first thing i'm going to do when i get out of this um if i may there's a bit about that which i'd just like like to read very quickly uh, which you have written is every night I was wheeled through a heated underground tunnel to an interconnected building, the Margaret Island Grand Hotel. It's opulent and it's exactly as you say, but then you say that you felt that you were able to see the guests from all of these, these eras, these generations. And the way you described it, and this is, I think comes back to Melmoth in a way, it made me think of The Shining. It made me think of the Overlook Hotel, the fact that time itself is sometimes porous in these places. The fact that we're bearing witness, not just to what's happening now, but everything that's ever happened. You know, there's an amazing Gothic fairy tale, well, ghost story called The Stone Tape, where a building begins to play back everything that's happened within it. And as well as sanatorium seeming like, you know, your body in a way is doing that at various times. Sarah, if I can come back to you, this idea of witness, um, that seems quite sort of important in a lot of your books and this idea of sort of um, bearing witness and that being quite a quite a thing to do, quite a damaging thing to stand and be, you know, quiet like a chair should, like I'm about to shut up, you know, um, to bear witness. Yeah, I, I was really challenged and it's very difficult for me to articulate this without sounding really priggish and I just hope everyone will forgive me for sounding unbearably self-righteous but um, the only way that I can carry on writing fiction is to persuade myself that it has some kind of moral and ethical value and I remember after the publication of The Essex Serpent, like immediately after and before I'd begun my next book, um, there was a series of terrible catastrophes around the world. There were the you know refugees fleeing Syria, 
uh, drowning in the Mediterranean, there was a massacre at the Orlando nightclub, and I experienced one of my periodic kind of bouts of existential unease when I thought I should have done something more useful with my time than sitting in a nice study making up, you know, oh, is it going to rain today or not in the chapter of this book, when I could have been, you know, probably quite a bad lawyer or doctor, but, you know, could have done something useful. And I remembered the line from Primo Levi's, if this is a man, where he spoke about the act of bearing witness as having moral purpose and being a vital part of um, having a certain um, moral agent and an action in the world that it does matter it does matter that we see things it does matter that we are cognizant of the of the suffering around us and so that's why Mel Moth became a witness um, and it enabled me particularly to talk about forgotten atrocities like the Armenian genocide um, the expulsion of German-speaking Czechs out of um, Prague and the terrible things that happened to them so yeah, I think for me, this idea of bearing witness is quite selfish because it en enables me to persuade myself that my books matter. I don't always believe that, um, but that's sort of the standpoint that I have taken for now. Sure. And I mean, a couple of the atrocities you mention are this terrible thing, disputed atrocities. So, you know, and in a way that ties right back into sanatorium because you, Abby, spend the whole book almost persuading people that you have the issues that you have you know as I was reading it yesterday I wrote down it's like the yellow wallpaper if you are wearing the yellow wallpaper as skin you know oh, I love that thanks you can write my next poll quote if you <laughs> well this idea it sounds absolutely sort of horrific of I have these problems no you can't see them I have these itches no they are not they do not manifest I am not crazy you know yeah actually um it was a really a really funny thing that happened. Uh, my mum always, my mum's been one of my uh, biggest uh, critics throughout my life, and and f she's normally my first reader. And um, when she she read it through once, and and she also has uh, as we, my fam, my whole family. I'm really lucky that ev almost every woman and most of the the men in my family have uh, the same genetic chronic illness, um, and we collapsed one by one. Uh, and I was the first one to get a diagnosis which meant that all of my my family could access that which was a real uh, privilege um, that not everybody gets to 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 see somebody else who's so like you in so many ways experiencing the same thing and, and trusting that it's real because you can see it hap happening to them um, and also that uh, it's a it is being confirmed uh, ge genetically uh, but uh, she read it the second time she read it through she said oh god Abby what if everyone thinks you're just crazy and this is all manifested its itself and I thought that was such an interesting fear to have about a book that is constantly being told that because that's her her biggest fear I suppose is that a, a doctor could read my book and decide that i that um, because I've romanticized some of the, the visions that I have, maybe maybe my pain isn't valid. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think the idea of bearing witness um, to it, I, I quite like. I, I quite like the Kafkaesque kind of sense of it constantly shape shifting and constantly being a different diagnosis or diff different words and and it not really mattering um, which version of ill or which version of could you are um mm -hmm. it's it's always going to come come back around um if that makes sense it sort of comes in circles um which feels a, a little bit like how you're describing melmoth sarah yeah i think this um, weird imperative to give agency and truthfulness to someone's stated suffering and stated unease um, and I'd been so lucky all my life and I'd been so healthy for so long and it was quite extraordinary to me to have to be put into a position to advocate for my own suffering and distress. Um, I was incredibly lucky with medics who instantly would take one look at me and kind of melt into puddles of pathos and um, proffer me a thousand tests and drugs. But family was a very different matter. And I can remember one of my sisters coming to visit and um, she saw me try to put my feet up on a footstool and it visibly causing me pain. And she said, oh, you are ill. And I thought, I mean, they don't routinely do emergency spine 
spinal neurosurgery on people who are making it up but yeah I mean I, it wasn't great um and so you know you have to kind of find ways to articulate and to explain something that is so nebulous and there isn't like a internationally accepted unit of pain kept in a cabinet somewhere where you can measure your suffering people just have to believe you and they often don't and then I suppose you have this extra layer because you're both so good at emoting you know this pain putting it on the page making people feel things but because you're both excellent at what you do it's more complicated than that because some of your pain abby it's quite orgasmic you know and some of the immediate aftermath is quite you know when you're talking about losing yourself in the pain that can be weirdly diametrically pleasurable in that way, you know, in the same way that Sarah, when you're writing the Essex Serpent about these very buttoned up times, there are moments of quite sort of unexpected erotic moments in those books. And it's almost that sort of the, the fly in the ointment that proves the rule, if you know, if I'm not mixing my metaphors too much, you know, the fact that you have this frictive element, the friction in it all, which actually proves the truth, the fidelity of what you're writing about. You know, just because I, you are in pain, why shouldn't I be experiencing this great sort of almost sort of elegiac moments of wonder? And that certainly cuts through Sanatorium Abbey. Yeah, I mean, the, so the pain, the moments, the kind of orgasmic moments um, happen, I would say that it's when your body has been through so much pain, it can't function, it the moments where I was climbing out of my body, um, I wasn't aware of pain anymore. Uh, I just wasn't able to function and I would be completely paralyzed. It would be like sleep paralysis, but it was happening in the day and anywhere. Maybe it's happening right now. No one's quite sure. Sarah, <laughs> while this is happening now, I will ask you kind of the same thing, the idea of the unheimlich you know, the being I mean, next door uh, to your it, That oh, became back. this very oh, part of it. I would, oh, did it, sorry, I was talking all about orgasms there and it cut me off. Um, <laughs> is it? it <laughs> Please talk again Actually, about no. orgasms. Do that again. Yeah. If you could go back. Yeah, I'll go. I'll just reverse. <laughs> uh, where the... When I climbed out of my body, uh, it, it would be, I would be in so much pain I wasn't sleeping and then climb out of my body and become paralyzed in my actual body and enter this otherworldly orgasmic space, and which was fantastic, except that my other body, the real body was completely paralyzed and I couldn't move my tongue, um, which is very similar to sleep paralysis, but it was kind of happening all, all the time in the day and the night while I was awake, while I was asleep. Um, and I think what I learned from that, I, I don't really, I don't know if I want to moralize it too much, but um, the only way I could wake up from the paralysis of it and come back into myself and the self that was incredibly painful um, was to surrender and allow myself to be in this orgasmic otherworldly space, which was, uh, inc and, and, and I only realized that when I was writing about it 10 years later, um, uh, I, don't, I don't have those out of body experiences in the same way and haven't for, for a really long time. Um, but it, I think the, the element of surrender and giving in to it is also, I suppose, what the book is te is telling me, um, because I wrote the book quite the book the book told me things that I didn't know about my own my own condition and my my own body. But actually, the on the only way I can function at all in the world it was to allow myself to completely give in to those moments and and, and let my body lead me kind kind of mm -hmm. thing um if and and I think I only learned that through through acknowledging the pleasure of the pleasurable moments and acknowledging the glamour of the glamorous moments as wow. well as the trauma of the, of the less glamorous and traumatic bits and and just letting it lead itself I think the word is is that uh, occurred to me is the idea of immersion you're completely immersed and you're kind of mm -hmm. going with the flow of that and you're kind of letting it be what it wants to be. Which yeah, is 
so I'm oh, sorry to cut, cut in. Um, I, I think I was looking a lot at the female mystics and what, what you can learn from, from female mysticism, uh, fem female in particular, because it's very different from masculine mysticism, but um, the idea of surrender um, has been really helpful. And I, I just didn't think I'd ever be able to write a book even because of my physical uh, restraint. One of the things that happens is a chronic hand pain and I, I, I had to quit university. I, I, I'd given up on the idea of uh, being a writer at all, which was very emotionally painful. And I realized that if I surrender to what my, the, the intrusions of my body, um, I could begin to build a practice around those intrusions and create a book that's much more fragmented and told in, in little snippets with, with uh, gaps for the reader to, to fill. Um, and, and so by surrendering, I was able to, I, it sounds horribly capitalist, uh, and I hate saying it like that, but by, it, I had to surrender in order to function at all. And I think that's something that, I mean, right now while we're in a lockdown, uh, surrender surrender is really important um, and not not trying to carry on as as normal um, has has been really helpful for, for me to remember by by looking at the text <laughs> yeah can we at this point um, Sarah could I ask you to give a reading because it would be lovely to hear you both read from your books yes. talking of voice and talking of surrender it's nice to be read stories <laughs> um, well I I do, there are depictions of um, torture and physical torment in the book, but I can't read them, <laughs> so I just get very distressed. Um, so I'll read a nice bit instead. Um, so I'll just read you the opening, which is to a certain extent a bit of a love letter to Prague, really, and um, might be transformative and um, take us out of our lockdown a little bit. Um, so it's only a couple of minutes. Uh, this is the paperback which I did have the hardback and then I opened it and found that there was a completely different book inside the dust jacket, which was quite uncanny. But <laughs> Look, it is winter in Prague. Night is rising in the mother of cities and over her thousand spires. Look down at the darkness around your feet in all the lanes and alleys as if it were a soft black dust swept there by a broom. Look at the stone apostles on the old Charles Bridge and at all the blue-eyed jackdaws on the shoulders of St John of Nepomuk. Look, she is coming over the bridge, head bent down to the whitening cobblestones. Helen Franklin, 42, neither short nor tall, her hair neither dark nor fair. On her feet, boots which serve from November to March and her mother's steel watch on her wrist. A table salt glitter of hard snow falling on her sleeve, her shoulder, her neat coat belted, as colourless as she is, nine years worn. What might commend so drab a creature to your sight when overhead the low clouds split and the upturned bowl of a silver moon pours milk out on the river? Nothing at all. Nothing that is but this. These hours, these long minutes of this short day must be the last when she knows nothing of Melmoth, when thunder is just thunder and a shadow only darkness on the wall. If you could tell her now, step forward, take her wrist and whisper. Perhaps she'd pause, turn pale and in confusion, fix her eyes on yours. Perhaps look at the lamplit castle high above the Voltava and down at white swan sleeping on the riverbank. Then turn on a half inch heel and beat back through the coming crowd. But, oh, it's no use. She'd only smile, impassive, half amused, this is her way, shake you off and go on walking home. Thank you. <laughs> the end. <laughs> I like your quite coquettish looks to camera. It's kind yeah. of like hey. just an incorrigible yeah. flirt, even when it's to do with trauma and horror and historical atrocities. The only way to get through it, mate. It's yeah. the only way. Um, Abby, if I can ask you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. Maybe I should. I was thinking of doing a different bit, but um, oh no, I think I'm going to stick with it because. I feel like, so mine's in fragments. I just, I, sorry, Sarah, I, was, I really enjoyed your description of Prague. And then I, I thought, oh, maybe I should read your description of Budapest. Um, but um, it, I, if I keep on talking about deciding, then I won't <laughs> read anything. So I'm going to read a bit. Um, 
it, the book's in fragments and I'm going to read a bit about London and climbing out of my body. When I bathe, the water turns yellow with sickness. And when we clean the bath afterwards, we are washing the sickness away. It sticks to our kitchen sink. Soon the air is clogged with the taste of sickness, more pungent and noxious. When other people come into my house, they faint. I have to blow on their eyelashes to rouse them and let them escape. Pretty soon, the plug hole refuses to drain. Sickness has blocked it, waxy and gray. Under the city it swells, a fat, a fat berg of sickness floating through the Thames. London. The inflatable bathtub begins to get an aroma about it, something mushroomy and thick. It is not entirely unpleasant. Only after I sit in the bath do I notice the dark ring of black forming around the rim. I try so hard to let my shoulders, not to let my shoulders brush against it. I hope that you fail to notice me now, surrounded by filth and fungus. As my cartilage melts in the water, I see the liquid around me thickening into gloop and glowing fibrous hairs. White blue fur sits damp on my tongue and heavy on my cheekbones, my fat knees. The bathtub is full to the brim with spores. I watch them grow, flattening out from papery threads into thick and coiling mushrooms, so dense and, dense and spongy I can barely move. Mushrooms springing out my arms, springing out of my neck, mushrooms between my legs, fat white mushrooms, thick and spongy. My toes are mushrooms, a moist old gray one crumbles into mush. The image fades. I sink my body deeper into the water. I do not return to the bathtub for a long, long time. That was lovely. Well, it was also, you know, horrific, but at the same time, it was great. It's kind of right in there with the idea of the metamorphosis. You know, it's the idea of the hybridity that I think runs through through your book, through both of your books. This idea of looking and looking again at the body and seeing it for what it is, which is this, you know, um, mass of living for now matter, you know, but it's it's so much compost later. And one of the things I was so struck by, well, by both of your books is this is this real interest in what it is to be alive, um, because it's uncanny, because it's weird, because are they ghosts or are they visions? It doesn't really matter, it's happening to me. Does that make sense? And mm -hmm. I, I wonder if I could pick up on something we were talking about earlier, which was the idea of the mystic, the idea of the religious. Abby, in your book, you write about um, St. Teresa of Avila, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, which I, I, I did some research, you know, I'm a professional man, a mystic so pure that she kept floating off to heaven. And so the nuns had to sit on her stomach to stop her from levitating clean off into the sky, feast day, 15th of October. That's neither here nor there. Mm. Um, and I love the fact that she is your patron saint in the book, in the same way that Sarah, you have your anti-patron saint of Melmoth, who's this kind of Viennelle character in a way. Can you tell us a little bit about what happens when Melmoth arrives? Because she's a witness, but what does she, what happens when Melmoth arrives generally? So there's a really um, tiresomely Calvinist uh, background to this, which is that, um, so as, as I, I never tire of telling people, I was brought up in a fundamentalist Christian home and was an evangelical fundamentalist Christian for many, many years until my late twenties, in fact. And what is very rarely understood or spoken about is that it is anti-mystic, it's anti-supernatural. So nothing is really spoken of as being strange. It is mere fact that the earth was created in six days and on the seventh day God rested, that Christ is God incarnate, that he died on, you know, all of this stuff is kind of taught and received as bare fact, as plain as 
the laws of Newton. So the idea of kind of devils or mystics or levitation or anything like that or um, stigmata or any of these things would be absurd, laughable, idolatrous actually. Um, and so I've now come out of that. But the one thing that I have retained is this idea that we are all equally um, sort of um, capable of doing dreadful things, that we're not born wicked or good, but that we're all equally capable of both great virtue and great wickedness and that we're all equally capable to kind of access grace and redemption and forgiveness. So Melmoth represents this idea that you can choose redemption or not. So the people that she visits have done terrible things, either on a large scale, uh, like in the Armenian genocide, or on a much smaller scale in terms of personal betrayal. And these people are tormented by the idea that they can never recover from this terrible thing that they did. And Melmoth appears to them and she sort of says, you're so depraved and you're so desperate and I'm the only person that knew what you did and I love you and I would have you with me. Come away with me. You can never, ever, ever be forgiven. So you might as well give up and come with me. And at that moment, the person has to choose whether they give up all possibility of redemption and all possibility of light and hope or they choose to believe that by living, they can make some kind of recompense and find love and, and so on. So this really weird thing where I'm kind of coming out of a very bare bones, kind of hard, ra almost rationalist, fundamentalist faith, which I've long left behind, and trying to find a way to explain the way I see the world now and balance it against the way I saw it for so much of my life. So I'm kind of edging towards kind of mystery, but trailing Calvinism behind me. Mm. And, I don't and, know if that made an ounce of sense. Oh, I think it really did. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I, I was just thinking about how um, the opposite my experience has been in that I, I grew up in a, uh, I, I was sent to a Catholic school when I was seven and had to do my communion as a Catholic, but, um, but holding the secret that I wasn't actually Catholic, it was just a, um, a good free school. <laughs> so uh, my mum kind of tricked the priest into letting me take my communion um, through lying. And um, so taking with me the weight of the original sin um, and knowing that I, I was already such a sinner because I suddenly had this very dogmatic faith put upon me and and um so much of of my early writing career has has been kind of making sense of Catholicism and and those those images of of what um of of how the world is is formed that they just they do really stay with you I think they really inf inform uh, your your writing practice in ways that are, are so mysterious and fascinating to explore. Yeah, I, I just but I felt like that was a really interesting parallel but opposite yeah. experience because Catholicism is so much about idolatry and uh, yes, yes. and mystics and and levitations. Uh, we love them. I mean, we I'm not one, but <laughs> love them. We've got a I've got a few minutes left. Now I'm I'm just going to ask a, a couple more questions. In, um, Abby, you are brilliant at well, you're genuine, genuinely, generally brilliant, but very good at writing sort of interesting things for your own biogs. One of the things I really enjoyed was that you're all about Instagrammable pain. So when we're when we're talking about this idea of iconography, idolatry, all of these things, can you tell me a bit about Instagrammable pain and how you seek to I think show illness and pain in an interesting way. Yeah I mean um, so when I did my research and development project for sanatorium uh, I wasn't sure which way it was going to go as I said I, I wasn't sure I was going to be a writer and at the same time as I was doing sanatorium I made a, um, a uh, an installation piece called Crip Casino which is about um, institutionalized space, spaces and gambling um, so it's uh, part of it is a series of fruit machines that um, every time you press the button they churn out a new diagnosis um, and, and then there's a, a, med a physiotherapy one where the physiotherapist churns out one instruction after the other every time you press the button and um, it's obviously it, both sanatorium and Crip Casino are very visually pleasing or aesthetic projects that they, that 
I, I like to think that I lure people in kind of seductively um, and, and um, Crip Casino in particular is a, is a very Instagrammable project. Um, and, and I feel like my practice as an artist is, is uh, very aesthetic and um, I seduce people in with that. And then hopefully they suddenly there, there's like kind of this biting anger on, underneath it and, and the pain. Um, people don't like to talk about pain if they're not in it. I think a lot, a lot of people like to imagine that it couldn't happen to them. Like, like Sarah was saying about, um, about the idea of, of not, of, of hoping that it's not real, I suppose. If you can't see it, maybe you don't have to acknowledge it might, it might be there. Um, and I think by making it vis visually appeal appealing and making it sexy and making a, a book that um, has a picture of um, a, a saint in orgasm on, on the front cover, um, which, which Sanatorium does, uh, I really like the idea of, of this period we're in where we it's never been easier to access information about pain and access information about your disability and i think for the, dis the disabled and chronically ill community that's been really really empowering but also um it's never been easier to turn off from that and look in a different direction um and um so so many women's bodies get denied the experience of of pain um it, particularly women's bodies um and particularly the more marginalized you are what, uh, the, the more likely it is that that uh your experience will be dis dismissed by a doctor so making it seductive and making people look in that direction and wearing wearing a clown costume or or um or or, or becoming very visually appealing in a way that it, it's it kind of like the i I guess um, it's it's like being a clown, like having a clown mask on, and then underneath there's all this agony that you, if you're in agony too, you you will tap into. Um, if that makes sense. Sorry, yeah. I had multiple. I just looked at a clown costume in the corner of my room and went off on a completely different direction. We've all got one. I mean, mine's just over there. Yeah. Um, I was. I mean, what you're talking about in a way is like smuggling in these really important um, sort of conversations by means of kind of like glamour or by means of subterfuge in some way. These conversations that are having have that need to be had in the same way, Sarah, with Melmoth. I think what you were doing, as you've already discussed, is the idea of smuggling in the moral, smuggling ideas of good faith, the idea of the good. You know that. You know, I remember going to an exhibition and somebody who was meant to be introducing the exhibition once said, of course, painting, he said, gesturing to the exhibition, very unfashionable at the moment, and then proceeded to dig a hole, which was amazing to witness. I enjoyed it so much. I couldn't help. I would. I was loudly saying, what's going on to be This is amazing. Is this part of it? Um, in the same way that I think novels that deal with morality you know, they have to do that. They have to smuggle things in because if you say this is a moral novel, people go, well, good for you. I'm going over here now where my clown costume is. Um, you know, was that something that you think about when you were- oh, Constantly. I mean, you know, I have never been anything other than deeply humiliatingly uncool. And it's not going to change now at the age of 40. You know, I have been an unfashionable, born out of time, kind of celibate Edwardian vicar called, you know, William all my life. And so for me to inhabit this space of profoundly, profoundly unfashionable, omniscient narrator, Sunday school, uh, moralizing fiction, where I will make my readers think about morality and ethics, and I will make them question what it means to be good, how do we live now? Um, I'm not going to stop because I can't. And um, I think the trick, as you say, is to pull off a kind of Trojan horse situation. So I've done it in a gothic horror novel, which is apparently so frightening that some people have had to leave it in the freezer overnight and has flocks of jackdaws smashing through plate glass windows as they herald the arrival of a 2000 year old bleeding footed monster and i'll smuggle my kind of deep 
anxieties around goodness in there or I'll do it with like a really filthy sex scene in a forest in Victorian fiction or I'll do it in my current novel which has astronomy and so on in it no I won't stop and it's kind of okay I've never been cool I don't care um and that's fine I mean to be fair if you if you sell a couple of million novels and then people <laughs> coming back for more it's their own fault really isn't it um thank you both so much before we end I'm going to wrap up now but thank you both so much for taking part and you both just such fantastic dresses just amazing I'm sure everyone oh. will have their own YouTube fan clubs I'm sure they will I'm wearing a jumper I would tell you more about it but frankly who cares here we go I'm going to wrap up and everyone's going to say goodbye um it's been a joy it's been thank so you. lovely um yeah, thank oh. you. Thank you, Stan and Sarah. It's been delightful. Well, every I think it's just the dream team. It's a wonderful, it proves that triangles do work. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much to Sarah and Abby and to everyone at home, all of you people, uh, for joining Book Band 2020 for this event. Uh, there are loads of great events like this, not quite like this, other events, let's say like this, on our programme. And search Book Band 2020 on Twitter and Instagram to learn more. Help us spread the word with the hashtag BookBand2020. Please do. Um, next on tonight, we have Emma Byrne and Freya Daly Sadgrove um, in conversation about robots, potty mouths, mental health. And that's posted, um, sorry, that's hosted by Georgie Codd, who's also amazing. Um, if you'd like to buy the work of our authors, and please do, it would be awesome. The links in the text below this video will help you through to Hive, who are an online bookseller which supports independent local bookshops. You know, they pay their taxes, all of that stuff, good stuff. Um, links to books discussed here and a discount code on selected festival titles are below as well. Uh, you will also find details of our author's favorite independent bookshops across the globe. Finally, uh, you can also find the Just Giving link, and this is important, this is great, to donate to our chosen charity supporting mental health mind that's below as well uh so thank you for tuning in huge thanks to abby and sarah who are amazing and um thank you at home for tuning in and being so ace and i'm gonna say goodbye and we're all gonna wave i assume because that's what people do bye thank you bye thank you bye keep waving <laughs> do i leave now <laughs> is that uh. what happens Thank you, Rabbi. That was awesome. Oh, you're very welcome. Are we still on YouTube or is this? I don't know. think so. I hope I not. That was Sarah's fun. She's literally gone. She's literally yeah. bolted for the door.